that I have to attend. And so I'm going to hand it over to Michael uh, here in a little bit. But we'll go ahead and get started on our conversation today. Dominique, I think we're recording. And I'm going to go ahead and read our statement as required, and then we'll kick things off. So the Tennessee Department of Education is excited to work with you on this opportunity to discuss the state's funding formula for funding public education. Before we begin, the department would like to remind you of the following. Conversations on this topic are not intended to reflect on the current BEP funding formula. The current funding formula will remain in place until a new formula is recommended to and approved by the Tennessee General Assembly. The public is encouraged to submit comments in writing to ensure that all communications are thoroughly documented and can be reviewed and considered in the future. Public comment is encouraged to focus on developing a new funding formula rather than revising the current funding formula. Consider what should be funded in a new funding formula and at what level. Subcommittees will be responsible for reviewing public comment and making recommendations for what should be included in a new funding formula. While all committees, subcommittees, and members of the public should feel free to communicate openly, documents and records may be subject to public inspection pursuant to the Tennessee Public Records Act and may be publicly posted or otherwise made available. And finally, all recommendations that are submitted by the committees and subcommittees will be reviewed and considered, but not all recommendations will ultimately be included in the proposed new funding formula. Dominique, do you need uh, any more time to take roll? No, I don't think so. I'll just make sure I have everybody captured. Harry, David, Jim, Karen, Tara, Catherine, Tom, Justin, Michael, Kate. Is there anyone I've missed? Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you for that. Uh, just to give you an overview of what we plan to discuss today, we should all have received the draft funding formula overview. Um, much of our recommendations have been included in that uh, in certain parts. We have talked quite a bit about um, the base funding formula uh, and the weights. And today we want to talk about specifically outcome first. So we're going to talk about the outcomes mm -hmm. section. I think that's where there's a lot of interest in this and where we've gotten a request from the department to provide some more recommendations and feedback. So I want to make sure that we take care of that today, given that we have limited uh, options available or limited time available. And then we'll get into um, circling back on the other three categories, the base, the weights and direct funding uh, and see if you have any more feedback there. And then if we have time, we will start our conversation on those broader policy recommendations that we're going to be making. So our next meeting next week um, is set aside in order to discuss that in, in particular. So uh, if we don't get to that today, that's fine. We'll have plenty of time at the next meeting. At least uh, today we want to get through uh, the outcomes discussion and then circle back and have any final um, feedback for the department on the, the first three categories. Any questions about that? All right. Well, if you go to the bottom of page three, the second half of page three on the draft formula overview, that's where you'll see the discussion around outcomes and some of the recommendations uh, that have been included in that for by the department. So I'd love to just open it up for discussion. Let us know, are there items in the proposed draft in outcomes that you want to discuss and have potentially concerns with and is there anything in or not in uh, the outcome section that you think warrants uh, a discussion and recommendation to the department justin i've got one one question uh it talks about the ready grad indicators with outcomes and then it lists uh, ACT, SAT, and others. And uh, are they saying that, uh, that those would be requirements for funding? Are those just suggestions? What, what What's the impact of those? I think the way the outcomes uh, category would work is that the, the department or the, the funding formula would set goals for improvements in those areas and then fund on a per pupil basis 
um, achieving those outcomes. So for instance, if you said a certain score on the ACT or a certain percentage of students in a school score at a certain level or higher, then that school would receive additional outcomes based funding um, calculated based on the number of students who achieve those goals. Uh, and so it, it would be more not so much you have to do this in order to receive the funding, but if you hit certain benchmarks, then you will receive additional funding as incentive based or outcomes based uh, funding on top of of the other categories. Well, I'm just really concerned that uh, we're seeing more and more universities not requiring these scores from applicants. And so I'm just wondering how how that impacts uh, even a, a particular school, because if a lot of their kids are going to try to go to one of those schools, one of those universities, then they wouldn't be taking one of these tests. And so those scores would not be available. So it's there are multiple pathways to being a ready graduate. ACT is is scoring a 21 on the ACT is one of those pathways, but students can also be a ready grad if they complete um, two two of early post secondary opportunities plus take the ASVAB and score a certain thing. Um, industry certifications they can do you know so there's a variety of ways that they can they can meet the ready grad indicator it doesn't have to just be the test so it would be one of the uh seven or so uh, that are listed there that would give uh the the kid the, the chance right yes you can kind of you can look at that little footnote yeah so they, you know, ACT or SAT is one way they can complete the four four EPSOs. They can complete two EPSOs plus an industry certification. Uh -huh. um, so it 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 doesn't have to just be the, the score on the test. Okay, thank you. I think it might be good. We'll communicate that to the department to ensure that as the reality shift on that, that that there is that flexibility that. You are not boxing them into specific tests or that type of thing if that does change. So okay. I think that's good, good feedback, David. Karen? Uh, Justin, are they planning on a single student being able to accomplish multiple levels of uh, additional funding? For instance, if they did the uh, FAFSA and they also did the ready grad, and let's say they did it, they were a CTE completer. Or, so could a single student generate additional revenues? I, yes, in, in the broadest sense, I think that, you know, you, you wouldn't be limited to one outcome. So if, if a student met three different outcomes that were available for funding, you could get funding for all three of those for that particular student. I do think that it, and, and Dominique, you may have a little more insight on this. Generally speaking, um, on the outcomes, they're going to set benchmarks for a certain percentage of students uh, to achieve a certain levels and then fund based off that. So there was another document uh, in our packet, the ES ECS memo, Outcomes Based Funding Models. Uh -huh. That shows how some other states have done this in practice and what they'll say, for example, uh, Arizona said that if um, 60, you know, if the amount per student will in, an outcomes funding will will go to the school if they performed in the top 27 percent or the top 13 percent then it bumps it up to a certain level so uh, it, i don't know if it's down to the student where each individual student could generate that if you set those overall benchmarks for the number of students having to, to generate it before it triggers that outcomes funding. But yes, I do think that any given student could assist in that, you know, achieving those outcomes in multiple categories. Because that would sort of change the way a guidance counselor was guiding the student. Right. Let's say coming from the eighth grade into the ninth grade for their four year career in secondary, but that would definitely sort of change the way we think about things now. 
You certainly wouldn't want to limit them. them to, you know, you've got to go do this because we get more funding. Right. Allow them to, to hit certain outcomes, um, you know, without limiting them to one or two or whatever. So I think that's a good, good feedback as well. Okay. Did, oh, so, Jim, you want to go ahead? How does this interact with the charter schools? I think a charter school uh, would be able to generate this this as well because they're considered public schools. So if the students in those charter schools achieved these outcomes benchmarks, that they would also qualify for that additional funding. Sorry, Kate. Go ahead. Oh, you're fine. Um, yeah, that's these are our the metrics we're using because I do work at a charter school. My question is. Is there anything for growth funding? Because a lot of our students come in, we start in sixth grade. They come in very low. This all seems at the end of high school um, outcomes. Is there no year over year outcomes for elementary schools or middle schools? That's something that we can certainly inquire about and recommend. I do think that other states have looked at performance-based funding for lower levels to allow in analyzing those increases throughout um, their, their schooling rather than just at the very end. The, of those outcomes that, that you all would think about, we could add to the list. This is one section that they are really still seeking feedback on because a lot of the outcomes that have been mentioned have been high school. And the steering committee, if you had the opportunity to watch that video, you know, have also asked, well, what does that look like for okay. middle school students and, uh, you know, maybe early literacy or elementary literacy? So if you have some recommendations there as a group, I can definitely add them to the list. Yeah. And any thoughts on some non high school completion um, outcomes that you would like? the the department to consider for lower grade levels or even you know seniors but that aren't geared towards test scores and and you know the, those final final elements tara you were next do you want to weigh in on that yeah there's a number of um metrics that we currently score on or not score but track on the state's report card including like discipline rates chronic absenteeism items like that um that would be maybe more encompassing of the lower grades um but to kate's point i would want to know how growth is feeding into this because especially for the elementary school grades i i don't know if we're looking at TCAP or TN Ready scores, um, you know, benchmarks like that. But a lot of these metrics that I'm seeing on the screen, these are rewarding school districts that already are achieving at these levels. And if we're looking at straight achievement, this is really just rewarding those who are already meeting the standards that they should. Obviously, we want schools to be at this level, but it seems counterintuitive that we would be giving more money to schools that are already able to meet these benchmarks, whereas the whole premise behind a weighted student funding formula is that some students require additional resources. So I'm not sure how this outcomes really feeds into that mentality that we're resourcing even more the students that are at a disadvantage. And they're, I mean, to be honest, these achievement levels may not be obtainable for many students, but growth can still happen and should be recognized. One quick note on that, and I think we should put something in about growth um, specifically, like you mentioned, but there some other states have uh, done this to where they take into account the economically disadvantaged population, for example, and so you would get more funding if you were a school that had a higher population of economically disadvantaged students so that per pupil uh, funding that would trigger for hitting an outcome would be higher in those schools than it would be 
in a school that potentially is already uh, hitting those those benchmarks. So that's one way some other states have done that, but I do think we should should make that recommendation back. Yes, I'm glad you called that out, Justin. If you all look at that paragraph, that is something that is included in this current document. And so getting your feedback around that is important. So it says the current recommendations would apply to all students, but include additional weight for economically disadvantaged students. And so I've added also in our recommendations document to include a growth, to include growth measures for students. Um, would you want that students in K-8 or all students? K-12. I would say for all students. I would agree. I think that you can measure. I mean, I'm just throwing stuff out there. I gave my kids the ACP and I only have ninth graders. So they took it between seventh and ninth and I measured the growth between seventh and ninth. It's not the best test for them. I'm just getting them ready to take that test. But I think if you had all the seniors take ACTs or juniors in the next year, you had some growth. I think Hamilton County's average ACT score is 18 much lower it's more like 15 for economically disadvantaged students so 21 is high it's necessary but it's really high to get all of your kids there so i think there's ways you can measure growth even if you're not everybody the percentage getting 21 to tara's point we're not starting at the same place i think that's a good piece of feedback michael you're next yeah, I, I want to flag uh, uh, third grade reading, uh, something that's in the document that you shared with us. But mm -hmm. Ohio does have a bonus program for third grade reading proficiency. Uh, we've recognized that in Tennessee as being a, a key goal. Uh, in the comment section, I'll share a document that provides feedback from the Fordham Institute, provides feedback on how to approve, improve Ohio's bonus program for third grade reading proficiency because it's a way to tweak the the, the outcomes-based funding to get the achievements we want and to do it in a fair way. So I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you, but I think that could be a key metric for literacy. I'll, I'll just add quickly as well. I mean, third grade reading is so important. Students mm -hmm. that aren't um, proficient in reading at the end of the third grade level are four times more likely not to finish high school. Definitely a good, good one to add. I think David, you're next. I'd just like to second what Michael said. I think it's very important that uh, we reward uh, third grade reading proficiency because as you indicated, uh, if they can't read at grade level by then, chances are they're not going to graduate and chances are they're going to end up on welfare or in jail or both. So I think it's very important a thing to measure. Good feedback there, Karen. I don't know exactly where we need to put this in, but uh, on measuring the economically disadvantaged, I looked at some numbers and, and I think there was some discussion at the steering committee about what data we were going to use and if we do not go back to a free and reduced lunch applica application, many, many students that are economically disadvantaged are going to be left out of the count because parents, while they may not sign up for direct cert, which is for free and for uh, food stamps, they would sign up to enable their children to receive free and reduced lunches. Now, of course, right now, uh, everyone is receiving lunches, but I think we probably are going to have to co go back to some type of application that schools can allow their parents to, to sign up. I looked at numbers particularly for one district, and while they had over 8,000 free and reduced lunch applications, they only had 2,600 who were direct SART. Now, that's a pretty big gap and I think probably Tara and can address this maybe even better than the rest of us but this is an issue that you know while we're 
counting ducks. We need to make sure we're counting everybody and giving everybody the opportunity to be counted. And I think we may be leaving some out. Uh, some discussion about the Title I waiting, uh, using the Title I numbers. And again, there may be people included in the Title I numbers that are not economically disadvantaged and there may be a school just because of the weighted factor there with the federal, the way the federal is capturing the numbers that we are, I think we just need to be able to reach out and touch the individual student. If that's what we're, if that's what our goal is, is to capture all, so. We'll include a, a note about getting some clarity on how that economically disadvantaged is. Chairman Justin, actually, I think that that is going to be when you move into policy. If you'll look down at those first couple of policy recommendation questions, that'll be the perfect place to have that conversation. Perfect. Chairman Brooks. Uh, there may be a need to look at the distressed counties factor in regard to the overall uh, weighted. Uh, I don't know, there, there may be something there that the state may want to consider as well. Okay, noted that. Any other thoughts on specific outcomes other than the, the high school completion metrics that are that are already included? This is a pretty good good additional list. I I got a question, Justin. Go for it. Uh, one of the earlier responses was about the ACT being 21 or higher and that uh, that might be too high. And I was wondering, are we going to put uh, another score in there instead of 21 and do the same for the SATs? Or how are we going to leave that? What are the thoughts from the committee on those particular numbers? Can we scroll back up just a little bit? Dominique, yeah, so 21 ACT and 1060 SAT, is that I a good I number? Is it too high? Is it? I don't know that you need to change it because I assume this was sourced by the Department of Education on success in college. ACT, you're ready grad, you're ready to go into the workforce. So I don't think it's that you have to lower it. I just think that you have to measure growth in districts that are starting behind. Because I don't want to change the standard and then have them fail in school. The dropout rate for low socioeconomic students is very high. So I don't want to lower that standard if that standard is measured by success in college or um, employment, certification, whatever. I just think you need to measure growth. If the first year you're graduating kids at 17, the next year you're graduating kids who can do a 19, um, that's a big growth in one year. Chairman Brooks, you had your hand up next. If I don't know if you, yeah, I think you already had it up, but if you've got some thoughts on the ACT or SAT score level. We may want to, wherever we wind up, match up with the scholarship standards um, so that, that they're one and the same. So wherever the, wherever the department or the legislature winds up saying, here's what you got to have, either a GPA or a test score number, whatever that is, the, they all need to be consistent. If, if we reward a scholarship to a student, that ought to probably qualify for outcome. It might be a way to do it. We'll note that for the department, match it up with the HOPE standards. Any other thoughts on the ACT versus SAT or ACT or SAT, Michael? Not on that direct question, just to note uh, on uh, work-based learning uh, completion, the WBL and apprenticeships, I think we just want to be clear what we're measuring there. So it's not just enrolling, but it's uh, completing. So award completion on those. 
not enrollment. Any other feedback on those pieces? So I think the biggest takeaway, uh, we'll, we'll add these specific discuss topics that we've discussed adding to the outcomes based. But I think the biggest takeaway from our subcommittee is that we look at growth rather than just flat scores as as a key driver for those outcomes. We look at any other thoughts on the outcomes? All right, well, I have to hop off in just a minute, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Michael so that when I do leave, I don't just abandon you guys. Uh, so, Michael, if you want to take it away, I think next we were going to discuss any final feedback we have on the base and direct recommendations. I think the weights came out very much aligned with what our recommendations were. Uh, and then if we have time, you can start to have the discussion around the policy pieces as well. So Michael, your chair now. Thanks, Justin. Right, as Justin said, this is a chance for us to look at the rest of the proposal, the base, the weights. And from our previous conversations, what we were recommending, um, what's missing? Uh, what are the big picture questions that we should be asking? What needs to be pushed back on? What should we be applauding? And I uh, hand over the floor. I don't know if this is a new hand, but David, I see a hand from you. Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that was brought up to me uh, as I talked around the community was unfunded pension liabilities. Has, has anyone given any thought to trying to do something to help in that area. That's a great question. Uh, I don't know if Dominique has any thoughts on that. I know that has not, from what I've seen, been part of the discussion, but it's a good point to note. I think that OPEBs or other post-employment benefits have been an ongoing issue for many districts over the years. Um, they've they account in some districts for a lot of their budget, but I don't think we collectively as a state know that, like to say they are X percent of budgets or the extreme. I know that some districts over the years have been really worried about that, um, just because those costs keep growing as they have more retirees. But I, my guess is that that falls outside the scope of this, but it is definitely an issue, if that makes sense. I wonder point. if it could be added as an additional flexibility piece where the district specific needs section is in the base. Maybe we could, I don't, you know, you all would need to tell me what language to put there if you would like that added. Thoughts on that question? Does silence mean that it's included or does silence mean it's not included? <laughs> I don't think I would understand how it's included to really have an opinion. Like I don't know enough about it and it might be a more local issue that's very district specific, like with their local funding body. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I think most of the time, you know, those are issues that are the, the county is grappling with, with taxpayers as a whole, rather than just the district. Um, but it is something we have a comment section, we can put a question in about has this been brought up and has have any discussions taken place around it? I think that's a fair thing to, to pose to the department. Great point. Chairman Brooks. Uh, two or three items. Uh, don't know what the current status of the statute is, but uh, school resource officers. I'm trying to determine if it's in the direct funding and uh, I, I don't. I may have overlooked it, uh, but I believe that's, on the state that's, law, considered, 
that's one of the things in the district specific needs section. Um, I will okay. talk just a little bit there about, you know, that their districts have asked and subcommittees have asked for flexibility in some areas, you know, like not everyone necessarily would need a principal or an assistant principal in every school, but they would need an SRO. Um, some flexibilities, that's what that district specific needs item is. And, you know, if you want me to call out SROs in it, I can. Great. Thank you, Dominic. I don't want because I think we need to recognize, unless the law has changed, and I'm not familiar with that, the, the, uh, another thought is that the state retirement is in pretty good actuarial shape. The, the local retirement, if you're not part of the state, uh, I do not know that status. If there is a local retirement issue uh, for a district that's outside the state, Pot of money and fix that in order with that is something outside direct funding and even outside the uh, base concept. Good question, Karen. I believe you're next. Well, on the post employment benefits, that would be varied by the individual district and whatever they've negotiated with their employees on what they're offering as post-employment benefits and the sustainability of that. So that would be, I think, specifically to a district. Uh, on the base, I guess I, I've read this and maybe I'm, uh, I'm not reading correctly, but do we know that we are going to include all positions? Or are we going to be having local funded, locally funded positions, or exactly how is how is the base going to work? Uh, is it based on ADM by school, or or is it too early to ask these types of questions? Because just looking at the base, I mean, anybody can make a list, but until we have numbers, that's not really going to mean a whole lot to folks that are taking those that information. It's like taking a grocery list until you get to the grocery store and see what it's going to cost you. You don't know for sure if you're going to buy it or not. So I guess, is that a premature question to ask how that's being going to be calculated? Uh, no, I, I will say on, I think the question of uh, students is very pertinent to this discussion. The question of calculating roles, I think, is also something we can add to this in term. But I believe I may have missed it. I think maybe Justin had mentioned in terms of uh, the rest of the numbers, especially dollar numbers, we're waiting on the budget um, around the state of the state. Yes, and I will add that you know anything that's currently funded in the BEP is also going to be funded, you know, if this if this new funding formula goes forward. So this list is trying to call out some things that may not currently be funded that that we want to make sure are added. And Thank then you, uh, Dominique. Like you said, yes, the numbers that will be coming later. That's a that's a separate piece. Yeah. Dominique, I think every school district in the state and I don't think there's a single school district in the state that does not have local funding positions that they're, the BEP does not recognize. And I think until we get to the point that we know exactly what the scope of our plans are for this formula, it's going to be hard for anybody to uh, say, well, this is great. Uh, just personal observation, I, unless you know what you're getting, you don't know if it's fully funding or not and right. for instance like based on whatever the allocation is for salaries is that going to you know that component alone is a critical factor for school systems that are trying to make a budget and figure out local contribution 
Right. And I know that this was something the local portion is something that the steering committee uh, discussed, but they don't really know the direction we're going to take. And so I think uh, our discussion can, for better or worse, remain focused on the state part, uh, which is what we do know. And I read read in today's paper, of course, that that there were going to be 10 different variables that or 10 different formulas that were going to be offered. And I was thinking, my goodness, that's a lot. (laughs) And uh, so I'm just. I know we're talking, but I don't know if we know what we're talking about. (laughs) Karen, some of the things that you've mentioned today are are the next step when we move into policy considerations. Um, Michael, if you want me to, I could just pull that up and let them see what's there. It's in your folder in the recommendations, and that way you can kind of see where this is going after you've landed on your final recommendations for those buckets. So if you'll give me a second, I can pull it up. Yeah, and I do want us to uh, to get to the policy part, but I don't want us to skip over the base and the weights and getting making sure that our feedback is in there. This is the policy is very very important, but I also don't want to miss our folks in the base and the weights. I know, um, I believe Kate, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, I wanted to point about the base. Um, one of the funding things is nurses, which is fabulous, but there's a huge nursing shortage. So I want to make sure there's flexibility in there for, um, I don't know if it has to be an RN. I don't know how the schools, we don't personally have one at our school right now. So there could be um, a health aid and maybe telemedicine options because we put nurses in there and we can't find enough nurses, which all hospitals are having problems. Now we're locking ourselves and there could be a, an innovative way to provide similar services. I just don't Great. know if nurses is defined. Great feedback. Sure. Chairman Brooks, I believe you're next. The uh, one item, well, it's not in the on page four, the last page, it would relate to probably direct funding. The University of PK for uh, the thought being is that may come here that if that were included in a direct funding and or maybe the BP. It would require a lot of expenditures in reference to construction. And it could very well be if that becomes something, it might be good to advise that the PK formula deal with dollars to the child and the child then can move the money wherever they're willing to attend uh, the pre-K on the basis that it would avoid this huge amount of money for buildings. Uh, because as the population changes, you know, five years from now, we may not need five classrooms in a building, only need two. Uh, so the thought that, that that might be something the state may want to consider because the private sector can lower and raise their uh, operations easier than a public entity can. So what would be your recommendation there exactly so I can type it, Mr. Brooks, around universal pre-K? And facilities that that it be based on uh, the money to the child and let let the parents then move the child wherever they choose because uh, that's unique in the sense of um, while it's a popular very popular method of an educational package in Europe and other countries uh, some countries don't have it some basically don't start our kids at school till they're eight or nine years old. Uh, but if we were to look at that as a direct funding concept, my suggestion is to allow the money to be assigned to the child, and then the child and the parent determine where they want to spend it. To avoid spending a lot of money on construction. Yeah, I Chris, I believe you were next. Um, Yeah, just really off of that comment on the concept of dollars following the student. I hadn't read this anywhere else, and and it's possible I missed it, but has there been any points made anywhere um, with regards to dollars following students to, let's say, a private school, Um, even at a reduced amount, like 
you know, three thousand dollars, something like that. Students not using the local district, so family keeps the money and gets to use it towards educational method of their choosing. If I missed it, it's very possible I missed it, but I, I have read through and I haven't seen anything. So at this time, this um, this current process is about funding public education, and that would be a, a separate process of, you know, those ESAs, as the, I think they were called before. So that is not a piece of this currently. Got it. Thanks, Dominique. Kate, is that a new hand? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Others, please, please weigh in. I've got a question. That is, uh, how how do we get the monies into the hands of the parents if we're going to base it on the per child? Do they get it in the form of tax credits or what? How, how do they get it? Can you can you clarify your question? I'm just wondering how we get the money into the hands of the parents if we're going to base it on a per child basis. Do you mean in the form of ESAs? I don't know. I don't know what what those initials mean. Oh, educational savings accounts. Oh, okay. So I think what Dominique was was saying was that it's an important discussion, but that's separate from this discussion. It, it the discussion of uh, I, was, I was picking up on what Mr. Brooks said. Right. Because he said, you know, to base it on a per child, and so I was just trying to think through how we get how do we make that happen as a practical matter. There is a discussion of, I think I've raised this before, of, of how we calculate how many students uh, are in a particular district and how how we calculate that. I think is important, but uh, but this is about funding public education. Get it, how money goes to schools and classrooms, um, separate from what money uh, may or may not in the future go to parents directly. Uh, Chris, I see your hand is up. It shouldn't be. I the question. You can dismiss me if that's an option. Not dismissing you at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a good question, and thanks, Dominique, for your uh, context here for the scope of our discussion. Michael. Yes. Uh, I'm only referring to the P pre K four. I'm not uh, talking about anything beyond that. I think, if I remember correctly. In the statute for our current pre K program, there is a provision that allows for uh, a non public pre K to be part of that particular uh, educational opportunity. So, my thought is if we're going to do universal as a direct funding mechanism, we apply the same methodology uh, that work that I think is in the current law, unless it's been changed. Well, I think uh, making whatever whatever we're doing with the student funding formula, ensuring that it follows laws that are already on the books, I think that should be a given. And so this should be part of the feedback we're offering to clarify how this complies with the rules already on the books. I, I think that's a very, very good point. Because that is not clear here. You're right. Are we still doing additional considerations? For yes. OK, the career coaches is another thing, and I really think it should be folded into counselors. That's been very valuable in my limited experience of being one um, in a ninth, a sixth through ninth grade. I think introducing students early is what gets the buy-in for academics. 
Um, and especially in a, in a low socioeconomic area or maybe a rural area, they don't know what's available. They can't, they can't gauge themselves towards something. So um, I think that's a valuable thing, just um, could be folded into counseling as well. Great point. Uh, Tara, I see you have your hand raised. Sure, I'm just trying to think of some of the things that are outside the scope of a classroom. Um, do we know where transportation falls in all of this? I'm trying to think of those ancillary, um, like district supported services that aren't just, you know, third grade classroom or a school building. Um, maybe central office provided services like HR, finance, um, professional development, instructional coaches, um, and then food service and transportation are like the big ones that come to mind, as well as like infrastructure for IT. I'm not sure where all of that falls, if it's kind of folded into the base in some way. Uh, I see like technology is, but the other things like transportation, payroll, you know, just like the non exciting parts of education that still are necessary to pay people and get kids to school mm -hmm. and feed them. So. Great, and I know that we've discussed that as being part of the base before. And it does say technology here, but you're correct. It does not specify transportation. And uh, Dominique, I don't know what's been discussed elsewhere, but I imagine uh, that could be under district specific needs. It does seem like district specific needs is kind of a catch all term. That there's a lot that could go under there. It, is, is that right? I would think so. I would I would um, also think that some of that is already funded would be part of some of the things that you've named would be things that are already currently funded that would be pulled in for this formula. I think my concern is just if it's not specifically outlined it's hard to know at what level then can I trust that it will still be funded. Like it could be in the BEP, which means that it will be included, but at what level? Because current funding in the BEP for some things may not be sufficient. And I will be honest, I don't understand exactly how transportation is funded, but I'm sure there are maybe some rural districts that would argue that it's not sufficient. So just saying it's currently funded in the BEP, so it will be categorized or it will be captured, doesn't necessarily mean that we're looking at it the right way and that yes. some changes might not be necessary to it. So and I don't I, see those things called out and that's just what concerns me. Okay, and we can call out anything that you want to, to specifically call out and add, but I will also um, point out that when we get to the policy section of which we'll be spending the majority of our next meeting on some of the ways that we define rural and sparsity will have transportation and you know what those districts some of those districts who do incur higher transportation costs some of those conversations will take place there good point and good area for clarification and any area that can be clarified in this uh, that does seem unclear, we should we should raise that now. It's it's very important, I think, at this stage. Uh, one one thing is, I believe uh, there was so there is poverty and concentrated poverty under the weights. There's rural. Uh, unique learning needs. Is there anything uh, missing there? Uh, Karen, I see your hand is raised. Well, back to the base. I think that you're yep. going to have to be sure, and something that has been left out uh, is that you need to have a central office component or administrative component, either in the district needs or under the educator needs, because there is no provision right now for finance whatsoever for human resources or for data management. And if we're moving to a student based type program, there is this is going to be a tremendous amount of data that's going to be gen have to be generated to generate the formula. And so some components 
needs to be included somewhere in this. And I think probably the base is the place it's going to have to be to uh, generate a data collection component. And I don't know where we mentioned this, but one of the things that has not been considered that was left out in funding for education is the uh, in the event of a natural disaster. And I think we've had, and I don't know where that would fall in, but somewhere in this, we're gonna to have to capture either in the physical capacity or in the base, some type of program for a natural disaster in a school district, because that's a component that any school district could face at any time. And so that consideration might need to be plugged somewhere and it might even need to be in a weighted area uh, in the event that something catastrophic happened in a district that they would be able to receive direct additional funding. Thank you for that. And uh, a, a question as well for, for Karen and Tara, since you uh, mentioned it. Um, so you said, uh, Tara, for instance, we need to find or fund sufficient resources to report back and the requirements for transparency. For, for the, the benefit of the rest of us here, how much from what you're seeing is the student funding formula uh, potential revision asking for new information and data and reporting? And how much is it based on current reporting and data is being gathered to calculate? How much is how much is new? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the requirements yet for how this is going to change the way we allocate funds to schools, um, the way we have to report back expenditures. Um, there are some districts that may not have up to date finance software, just even I'm not saying because of this funding formula, but just in general, there may be needs where accounting and payroll and all of the processes and systems that central offices are using may not even be up to date. So I'm not saying it's specifically because of this, but just in general, getting districts up to the 21st century for infrastructure needs may be part of this as well. And there is a lot of reporting that is required from school districts for federal programs, for to TDOE, I mean, it is huge. And I would say probably under-resourced in many places just to keep up with the current requirements. So if there's additional ones, that's just something to keep in mind as well. It's not a simple press a button and run a report. It's just, there's so much data verification that comes into everything. Thank you, Tara. Yes. Chairman Brooks, I see you have your hand raised. Just a question asking some clarification. If uh, if there is a child, a student that is in regard to the unique learning needs category and resides in a rural county and is in a uh, free and reduced poverty category, would that child re receive, assuming all of these are weighted, three weighted concepts, or would one take precedent over all of them? That's for a question for whomever for clarification. Are they separate uh, or can we, can a student that is a second language learner or that's maybe moved in from Afghanistan in a rural area uh, that uh, obviously uh, has difficulty uh, in the uh, financial factor as well? And that's just a question for clarification from the department. I believe. Tara, good question, Tara. I believe uh, you had an answer to this. The student can have multiple weights applied that it is cumulative. Good question. Uh, anyone else that I'm missing? Uh, David, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I, I would think that every category that they fall into uh, would be justifiably compensated for. So if they were in three different categories, like Mr. Brooks brought out, uh, then they would get uh, three three ticks uh, for that, I would think. I don't see how you could exclude one of them. That's the intent, yes. 
Karen, I see you have your hand raised. Well, I think data management needs to be included in the base. I don't know what you call it other than data management, but I think that is a component and that's an expensive component because that's personnel and software. That are, and, and it will take, you can't just add this hat for this type of data collection to somebody else, someone's job that's already in existence. And you certainly can't add it to a school secretary because she's already uh, wearing multiple hats, including security. So that's just uh, from a viewpoint from a school district. Let me tell you how I've captured that in this document, and then you all can tell me whether I need to add something. So I've put one, that this group wants to make sure that all things currently funded are adequately funded in the new formula. For example, transportation, HR, personnel, instructional coaches, data management, et cetera. So what have I not captured? Well, Dominique, I think that data management might need to stand alone because, you know, when you look at what we're asking or what we're wanting, we're going to be looking at every student almost with an EI uh, education plan for that, for every student. And so there it seems like they're all going to have a bill of sales that's going to go with them into this formula. And uh, that's going to take some time. Thank you, Dominique, too, for keeping track of all these notes and this feedback. Uh, and the remaining, it's, it's a lot of work. And the remaining time, anything else that we want to press on in the base, the weights, outcomes, anything we've missed? I've got a comment in general that I'd like to make. That is, I don't see how in the world we can start out by saying that everything funded under BEP gets funded under the new plan. To me, that really uh, subverts what our committees are supposed to do. I, I just don't see how we can start with a base of saying that all everything that we're already paying for uh, gets paid for. And then all we get to do is really fool with the monies that are left over, so to speak. Anybody else have that concern? I think that that's that's an important comment to be added, uh, and I know I know Dominique is also keeping track of this. Uh, one other point, I believe, Tom, you had a question on. Uh, thank you, Catherine. I believe Tom, you had a question on high growth districts. Uh, under direct funding, there is a category for fast growing districts. Uh, one open question is, I know some of the student funding formulas have placed fast growing under the weights. This is under direct funding. Just observing that. But it is included here. I just know it's very taxing on those districts. Just concerned with it. Thank you. Dr. Jim. I, I'm following up on uh, David's comment, and I think he's he's got an interesting uh, question here regarding if it was in the BEP, therefore it's funded. I'm wondering about the, the maintenance of effort from the local side. Is there is there is there anything there that we need to be considering? How might we do that? Not with this. I will say uh, again on the local question. It's an it's an important one. I know that this is something that the steering committee is given us some guidance on of just saying like let's bracket this discussion focus on the state the local is very important they're not sure what direction to take but we can focus on the state side for now okay and and with that i know that we're at time uh dominique anything that we've missed here that we should be going through and i know next up 
we'll really focus on the policy question. So I would just recommend that you do go look at the policy. It's the recommendations for meeting five document in your folder. Um, kind of, you know, you scroll down just a little bit. That way you can see some of the policies that we'll be focusing on in the next meeting. So um, just, you know, that would be a good place to spend a little bit of time before the next meeting. And I believe our next meeting is on Monday, the 24th at noon, if I have that right. That's right. It's all there. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I, I think it should be clear by now, uh, this should not be the end of the feedback that this committee is giving on these questions. Um, through, the, through the input uh, that we already have, through the emails, through all that kind of stuff, please keep this up. And let's be as specific as possible, specific and actionable as possible, um, both in the the specific steps we can take and just all, also overall general feedback is welcome too. And with that, we'll see you next week at noon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking over.